here. I'm gonna give a few minutes to just let everybody settle in. And then I'm gonna kind of kick things off and get us started. We have a lot to fill in the evening, so definitely don't wanna waste any time. All right, and as people are wandering in, I'm gonna take care of a few housekeeping items. First of all, just as a reminder, I know it's on the email, but everyone's mics will stay muted and cameras will stay off for the presentation. This is in large part due to the fact that we are recording these webinars so that we can post them and have them available to people past this webinar date. Um, we will, however, have the chat feature open. So throughout the presentation, please feel free to submit any questions that come up. We'll reserve some time at the end for Q&A. Of course, I'll also be giving out my information at the end. So you can also feel free to submit a question that way if you rather after the presentation and reach out to me for any concerns or needs whatsoever. All right, well, with that out of the way, I am going to open us up in prayer. Always a good way to start. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of every soul present with us this evening. Thank you for the way that you so lovingly place over our hearts a desire for true, lasting, abiding love. You show us that love on a daily basis. Lord, help us to always receive it so that we can transform our hearts and allow them to love the way that you do. Lord, help us to also see the ways that you are loving us through our circumstances, relationships, and vocations. Lord, if you designed and created the Institute of Marriage, we pray that you would continue to guide all of our efforts to understand it, embrace it, and live it out to the best of our ability. Give us the strength and grace to live out holiness in our families, no matter where we are starting from. This evening, let us receive whatever lights, insights, or messages you have planned out for us, and may our time together glorify you and who you are. I pray this in your name, amen. amen. All right. Uh, let me get us started. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's such an honor to be here with you for our first online marriage enrichment series. This is a series we have done several times in probably about a dozen parishes throughout the Archdiocese, but this is our first time doing it online. And to give a little background on what brought about this series, it was really several priests and pastors throughout the Archdiocese who recognized the lack of couple and family support at the parish level. They saw a need for common language and understanding when it came to certain core concepts around marriage and healthy relationships in the Catholic Church. So the idea was to create a marriage series to hopefully go over some of these main tenets in a way that brings a little enrichment for all of us, whether it's new information or a refresher, and whether we've been married for a few months or a few decades. And it's certainly my hope and prayer that over these next several months, this series be something that edifies all of our relationships in whatever way God deems. So to start us off, as you can see, the first area or topic we wanna to touch upon is differences. And we talk about the differences in a couple and the many types of variances and differences that can exist, some of which I hope to just scratch the surface on today. I think it's impossible to not have the topic bring us back to the purpose of marriage. And what an appropriate way to start us off with this little series. So if God's ultimate goal, period, is to bring us closer to him, closer to who he authentically created us to be, a definition of holiness, by the way, then doesn't it make sense that an institution he designed all the way back when our great-grandparents were still sporting fig leaves in a garden somewhere would be an instrument or a catalyst for achieving that goal? And if I think that in order to grow closer to him, I am ideally supposed to grow in virtue, so obtaining patience, compassion, forgiveness, empathy, selflessness, sacrifice. 
then doesn't suddenly the concept of sticking two different people together and telling them to live and love in close proximity, close enough to see and rub up against each other's differences, as well as their flaws, weaknesses, failures, shortcomings, hurts, wounds, fears, and fun personality traits. Doesn't this suddenly sound like a recipe or at the very least an opportunity, an invitation to grow in holiness, to become more like Christ? G.K. Chesterton is quoted as saying, the greatest feat of human engineering in all of history is the bridge that has been built between a man and a woman called marriage. For building that bridge certainly requires strength, courage, but most importantly, God. So surprise, surprise, yet again, we see how everything God has created is designed to bring us home to him. And that includes marriage and our differences. Okay, so we understand that differences are ultimately a part of God's plan. He's so clever. So why study and work to understand our differences? Well, maybe the answer seems obvious. But for the point of this series, to have a greater awareness and understanding of who your spouse is, how they operate, how they tick, and how they may think differently than you do, I can almost guarantee that last one, allows for something we call exceptional rapport. In our last talk, we'll be exploring what is called this exceptional 7%. This is a segment of married couples that rates themselves as the most satisfied, happy, and intimate in their marriages. And one common factor amongst those 7% couples is an exceptional rapport, where knowledge, acceptance, and respect for who their spouse is, again, how they operate, allows them to have a stronger connection and affection for one another. But along with exceptional rapport, I personally like to talk about superpowers. So I don't know if anyone has seen those old AT&T commercials where the guy is interviewing or asking little kids questions. And one of them, he asks, so which is better, one superhero or two superheroes? And one of the little kids goes, uh, duh, two superheroes, because that's like a lot of superpowers. And it's cute and humorous as this commercial is. I think the kid's wisdom really applies here. There is no question that being different is unbelievably challenging. God has a sense of humor in the combinations of people he brings together in marriage for sure. But it also brings this potential of double superpower because chances are we have different talents and gifts that we can contribute to make our own dynamic duo. Also, the power of two improves you because being different allows us to learn about things that are outside of ourselves. In a relationship, we're gently forced to come more center, temper our extremes. But again, we can also learn from those skills, assets, and talents our spouse brings to the table. There was once a priest who, when talking about the need for differences in a couple, said, well, if you want to make tropical punch and all you got is strawberries, that's just strawberry juice. But if you get together with a pineapple, well, that can be a game changer. And now you can stick a ladle in it. I'll be honest, I usually had no idea what this priest was talking about. But I think in this area, I understand what he was getting at. All right, so we only have less than an hour and there are many types of differences we could explore. But for today, we're going to do just a brief intro or again, for some of you, maybe a little revisit, refresher on some of the big ones. Please note, this is going to be just a gentle overview. Each of these could have its own dissertation or two hour talk to really get into the theory and application. But for today, I just wanna highlight the key points and then provide the resources to point you in the right direction if something resonates with you or you would like to go in a little deeper. So we're gonna start off with the money personalities, then move on to love languages, temperament, family of origin, 
and finish off with some differences between men and women. But before we jump in, it's important I give a few disclaimers to hopefully avoid anyone being offended, confused in any way. So as we start talking about categories and types of personalities, temperaments, men and women, it's important to say that this is not meant to label people, put anyone in a box or feed stereotypes. Every single person and every single marriage is very unique. And while these concepts exist to help give us a deeper understanding on general human qualities, they are not an all-encompassing universal mold for everyone. A helpful thing to come back to is what we call in the research field the 80-20 rule. This means that when we're talking about something being the case for the majority of the time, it's usually somewhere around 80%, which still leaves that 20% exception. So if at any point you find yourself in that 20% exception, please know that's absolutely okay. And this is the beauty of human variant is to be expected. Also, none of this is pop psychology. These are concepts that are widely used as tools and conversation starters, both in marriage prep and marriage counseling. And when we get into differences between men and women, I'm going to be using only concepts that are science and evidence-based. So again, no throwing around stereotypes. Lastly, hopefully it goes without saying that with everything we're looking at, there is no right or better category, meaning there isn't a temperament, love language, and certainly not a gender that is the right one to have. They're just different, different but equal in their value and significant role they play in keeping both our world and our relationships balanced. Hope and reflective of God's creativity, mystery, and love. All right, so without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into our first topic, money differences. And just to give a heads up, I'm gonna be covering the money differences in love languages, and we'll be taking just a short little break for you and your spouse to go over a few questions or chat a little bit, use the restroom, get something to eat. It'll be just about five or six minutes and then we'll jump back in. So for money differences, we talk about a type of difference that creates a great deal of conflict in relationships, it's money. 70% of divorces cite money as the number one reason for their divorce. Money affects every aspect of our life. So many choices in the family, so many decisions in a day. And if you argue about even just a percentage of them, well, it's going to create some stress. One of the things to note though, right off the bat, is that your money relationship has nothing to do with your budget. It has nothing to do with your savings or how much debt you have. This is considered your financial arrangement. Your money relationship is about the decision to make as a couple in which money is involved and how your two approaches, attitudes, feelings, and dispositions towards money interact. And why I think this concept of money personalities and money relationship holds some merit is because there are so many couples whose finances are fine and yet they still cite money as the main source of their problems. And even in my own experience working with couples, the issue often isn't about poor financial planning, lack of assets, or their 401k. It's about the misunderstandings, miscommunication, and frustrations about how the two approach or think about money. Now, please don't think I'm downplaying the importance of having your financial ducks in a row. This is extremely important. But along with that, it's just as important to know why you think about and deal with money the way that you do. Because as we said, for so many couples, this is where the conflict lies. 
What I liked also about the money personalities, it's a little more comprehensive than the usual division that gets made between spenders and savers. And again, in my own work, it was easy to see that these two categories were slightly deficient in capturing the variances in people's approaches. Within this concept, your money personality is part of your own unique DNA. So it's not based on your family of origin. I can again attest to this since there are way too many spenders that come from security seeking parents or savers that came from spenders. So to summarize, everyone thinks about and deals with money in a unique personal way. Your money approach is innate, part of your own personal nature. And yes, we will get into how your formative experiences can shape your behaviors, your attitudes, but the idea is that you start off with kind of your own approach and instincts. All right, so what are the five money personalities? Well, we have saver, spender, risk taker, security seeker, and flyer. And in this concept, you have a primary and a secondary, and the two can interact and interplay. Each one, similar to those temperaments, has its strengths and its challenges. Each of them can help one to make great financial decisions, and each has the potential to get into financial trouble. So figuring out which one you may be isn't about pointing out your flaws or figuring out which spouse has the better one. It's just to help you understand maybe a little bit more how you approach money and also what's important to you when it comes to finances. So I'm going to be going through each one. I'll start off with the money personality most of us are familiar with. And as I go through each one, I'll highlight some common aspects as well as the challenges they may face, but end with what great gifts they can contribute to a relationship. So a saver has never met a deal they don't like and free be cheap every time. You may be a savior, saver if you get a genuine rush from saving money. So it's a source of pride to get something you wanted for less. You're organized, responsible, and trustworthy when it comes to finances. You rarely spend money impulsively. Savers will often scour the internet for details, plan every detail of their purchase, and make sure they have the money in hand before making it. And you avoid debt at all costs. Now, some challenges for this personality could include stealing joy, so sometimes resistance to spending money can reduce the fun out of enjoyable things, such as seeing a movie or going on a vacation. Sometimes being overly focused on financial goals. Sometimes savers think only about the money aspect of things and forget about life. The idea is it's great to have goals and work hard to meet them, but sometimes it's also good to swallow anxiety and let ourselves and others enjoy things, even if it costs something. Also, sometimes being labeled as cheap because they have a hard time parting with money and could come across as this, or maybe even selfish to others. However, save, savers can still be great partners because they are careful about spending and they usually spend wisely. The challenge for them is to see money as a means to an end and not an end in and of itself. All right, here's another one we've all heard of, the spender. For a spender, there's a chance to spend money, they will spend it. And for spenders, it's often not about having more stuff. They don't care how much they spend or who they spend it on. Spenders just like spending. You might be a spender if you get a general thrill from the purchase. You tend to live in the moment. Spenders are often focused on making great memories and fun today, even if there's less for tomorrow. You love to buy things for other people. Spenders get a lot of joy out of giving gifts, helping out, and treating other people. Their challenges may include being impractical. So spenders are usually impulse buyers. They don't often have a list or do research or plan for their purchases. 
This can sometimes contribute to being non-communicative. All that impulse buying sometimes means that spenders don't think through, much less talk through their purchases with partners. And this lack of communication can be frustrating for a spouse. Also filled with regret. You say Christmas is so great, and then January 15th is never pretty. Spenders rarely regret the purchases or fun they had buying and giving things, but they regret getting carried away. And lastly, a budget breaker. Spenders can put together a mean budget and have great intentions of sticking to it, but struggle with the follow through. If left unchecked and in extreme cases, this can lead to debt. Spenders might even feel bad about overspending, but have a hard time stopping themselves in the moment. Nevertheless, they too can be a great partner because they will never let finances get in the way of truly living life to the fullest. The challenge for them is to respect the money expectations of their spouse and work together on regular communication and sometimes reining themselves in. All right, the next money personality is our risk taker. Now, risk takers are the ones who are very entrepreneurial. They're not afraid of ventures or investments, and they often see no reason to let money sit in a bank when there's the possibility of using it to be part of something amazing, intriguing, or innovative. If you're a risk taker, you are probably a big picture person. You love finding the next financial thing. You get excited by possibility, and you usually listen to your gut more than conventional wisdom or financial experts. Intuition is what risk takers usually trust. Also, you aren't afraid to make decisions. Risk takers don't mess around when it comes to money. They're extremely decisive, and when they make a decision, they make it quickly. If you are a risk taker, the suggestions of things to be on the lookout for include being blinded by possibility, so sometimes when they get an idea about something, reason has left the building. And with it can go concern or sometimes thoughts about other people's feelings, attention to details, and long-range planning. This could lead to being resented in a relationship. Even if in a relationship with another risk taker, those quick decisions and leveraging of assets can sometimes create resentments. Also, at times, being impatient or insensitive. Because risk takers hate feeling hemmed in, so sometimes rather than working for the compromise, the temptation is to charge ahead and then deal with the relational fallout later. So, as with all of them, they can be a great spouse because they're always thinking about the future and they have great ideas and are often very creative when it comes to money. The challenge is to make sure their spouse gets to stay involved and especially be willing to say no to something if it's outside of somebody's comfort zone. Now, very different and opposed to the risk taker is our security seeker. Security seekers crave predictability. They usually don't have problems about spending money. For them, it's just a matter of making sure they're spending it wisely. They like to know their future is settled and safe. They're all about planning, consistency, and clear expectations. When it comes to money, their motto is the safer, the better. They love a sense of order and predictability. You're probably a security seeker if you are an investigator. They're very trustworthy, willing to sacrifice. Security seekers would rather do without today than without tomorrow and they won't spend money until they know all obligations are covered. Also, you're prepared for anything. Security seekers are very rarely caught without a plan. Some challenges for this personality, sometimes being overly negative. So because they get so nervous about risk, the temptation is to say automatically no to all new ideas that come along, especially ones not in the plan but this could cause the potential for being controlling. Also getting stuck in a research rep. We call this paralysis by analysis. 
In other words, getting so caught up in avoiding buyer's remorse or making sure an opportunity is foolproof that they can get stuck and be afraid to actually act. Also stifling creativity. Sometimes the need for security can become so all-consuming that they stop seeing things realistically. The need for cushion and certainty grows and escalates to the point of possibly losing flexibility. So they too can be an amazing spouse because their careful planning and steady approach to money can help a couple to stay secure. The challenge for them is to resist making decisions solely out of fear and know how much financial security is enough. I we saved our most unusual money personality for last. A flyer doesn't think about the money component of a decision at all. They're not anxious about it. They're not consumed about it. They have absolutely no emotional response to money. You may be a flyer if you are big on relationships and not motivated by money. Connections or relationships with others is much more their motivator. Also, you're happy to let someone else take care of the finances. This can be a plus in relationships, especially if the other partner has a different money personality. Now, they can't escape the challenges either. For them, it could be being reactionary. So because flyers don't think about money, but money is the necessary part of life. So sooner or later, they have to pay attention to looming bills and retirement. And when they do, sometimes they make decisions out of a panicked fear versus good advice. Also lacking in skills to solve money problems. This is because honing money skills necessary to manage it and be responsible aren't exactly on the priority list. And lastly, disorganized and unresponsible. We say unresponsible versus irresponsible because irresponsibility suggests a deliberate lack of maturity. But flyers usually aren't trying to be lazy or unattentive. They just genuinely aren't thinking about it. But as with all the many personalities, they can make a great spouse because they're fairly easy going about money issues. They certainly aren't going to be uptight and controlling. The challenge for them is to stay involved, informed, and invested in the family financial picture. All right, so those are the five personalities. And at the end, I'll show you where you can go online to take an assessment if you're curious to find out which one you are. But there are a few other little additions to this theory that we don't have time to get fully into today, but might be of interest. The first being the opposite dynamic. Now this can exist both in yourself and in your relationship. The opposite dynamic can be the internal conflict so many of us experience when our primary and secondary money personalities clash. It's when your two components have two opposing needs. It can also exist in your marriage. 80% of couples are married to the opposite money personality. And misunderstandings and clashes and money approaches can lead to what the authors of this concept called financial infidelity. So things like hiding money, hearing the word no, over control, spending one in debt, money secrets, lack of planning. Couples are encouraged to identify areas of money infidelity and explore how to change their dynamics in this department and address each other's needs in a way that helps remove some of these patterns. So, to help accomplish this, the authors also stress and strongly suggest what they call money huddles. So 45 minutes a month to evaluate your finances, look at your needs, and work on blending your money approaches together as a team. Honestly, no matter how you do it or what you call it, Sitting down and talking through your finances together on a regular basis is extremely, extremely important. Not only does this help you to avoid confusion and frustration, but it also helps to increase both partners' awareness, identify any problem areas, get on the same page, and encourage financial progress. 
But during these get-togethers, it's really important that there be some understanding and compromise. So using words that affirm the other's needs and collaborating so that it's a team effort. No one person is in control. You may have to learn about things that you don't have a propensity for, but even if it's not the natural way you operate, this is beneficial, we know, to both you and your marriage. Because as we said before, your differences could make you stronger together than you could be on your own. And it helps to create that balance overall. Okay, so before our first little break, we're just gonna stick with this trend of five and move on to the five love languages, which I'm pretty sure most of you have heard before. But it has to do with this concept that we all give and receive love in different ways. And in this idea, what fills my love tank, so to speak, may be different than what fills yours. And why this can be challenging in relationships is that we tend to give love in the ways that we like to receive love for ourselves. But that might not be the primary love language of our loved one. This could lead in a marriage to my spouse not feeling or registering the level of affection I'm desiring to give because it holds less meaning for them. They're craving and desiring something different. So it's worth learning and knowing your spouse's love language so that you can become more intentional and purposeful with actions that really register love and care to them. So again, I'm just going to do a quick summary of the all, all five, starting with words of affirmation. Your actions don't always speak louder than words. If this is your love language, verbal compliments or words of appreciation are powerful communicators of love. They're best expressed in simple, straightforward statements of affirmation. Hearing your spouse say out loud the positive things they think about you. Very kind, encouraging, and uplifting words. Conversely, insults are going to be very hurtful and not easily forgotten. With quality time, the second love language, nothing says I love you like your full, undivided attention. I don't mean sitting on the couch watching television your Netflix or your phone has your attention, not your spouse. Here's any activity where you are making eye contact, devices away, full attention to each other. It can entail taking a walk, just the two of you, going out to eat. What matters is you being there fully present. The what doesn't matter as much as the focus or intent. What's hurtful for this love language is distractions, postponing dates, or failure to listen. Now, our third love language, gifts, sometimes gets a bad rep for being shallow or materialistic. But this is far from the truth. At the heart of this language is the love, thoughtfulness, and effort behind the gift. The gift is almost a visual representation of the relationship. So get to something you can hold in your hand and say, look, he was thinking of me or she remembered me, or maybe you can't hold it in your hand, but you can look at it and appreciate it. It doesn't matter what it costs necessarily. It's the effort that was made that shows that someone's being cared for. Hurts for this language would be missed birthdays or anniversaries, a hasty or thoughtless gift, or lack of everyday gestures. All right, now physical touch. If gifts gets the bad rep for being shallow, this one is sometimes mistaken for being all about the bedroom. And absolutely, physical or sexual intimacy is an aspect of physical love, but it's usually much more about the other little aspects. So getting close together, hugs, pats on the back, back rubs, holding hands, thoughtful touches on the arm. Seems simple, but these little things communicate your love loudly. The hurt, well, of course, abuse is the obvious offender, but also a spouse who's withdrawn or neglectful, meaning the absence of your physical presence or touch. Last but not least, acts of service. 
Okay, here actions really do speak louder than words. Acts of service means doing things that you know your spouse would like you to do. You seek to please them by serving them. This can be things like cooking a meal, setting a table, emptying the dishwasher. They require time, effort, energy, and intent. The idea is that you are easing the burden of responsibility weighing on your spouse. So the words, let me do that for you, or how can I help you, are very meaningful. Hurts will be laziness, broken commitments, or worse, making more work for them. Now, if you're not sure which one your spouse's love language or main love language is, you can ask them. But also at the end, I'll give links and information on how you can do an assessment if one really isn't sure. And it can be a great resource for sparking ideas and conversations on how to really become fluent in your spouse's love language. The idea is that we also want to have a fully balanced diet of love languages. Meaning the same way becoming fluent in multiple languages improves and strengthens your linguistic skills and connection, becoming fluent and practicing all of the love languages really strengthens your bond and connection with others, but especially your spouse. All right, so as promised, we've reached, reached our first little break, and I'm going to leave up on the screen a few questions that if you would like, you and your spouse can peek at and discuss maybe in the five minutes, starting with what money personality do you relate to the most? And again, I list out spender, saver, risk taker, security seeker, and flyer. Then what type of strength does your money personality bring to the relationship? What about the strengths of your spouse's money personality? And lastly, what is your love language? What are five things that register love to you the most? And this can be things that your spouse is already doing or things that you would appreciate. And again, you can go over some of these questions, none of them, feel free to use the restroom. Like I said, I'm always more entertaining while you're eating a snack or chocolate at the same time. So I'm gonna turn off my screen for just five minutes and then we'll be back to finish up our part two. Enjoy guys and see you in just a little bit. All right, everyone, I'm gonna call us back only because we still have a little ground to cover and I don't wanna keep you here all night. Okay. All right, so moving right along, way before the money personalities or love languages. Oh, sorry, second. I was just informed maybe the slide isn't switching. Not switching? Okay, guys, give us one second. Technical difficulties. Okay, hopefully we're back in business. Everyone can blame me. I tend to break technology with my presence, so it's just bound to happen in all of these webinars. It's actually a miracle. It hasn't happened to a more severe degree. Okay, so moving right along, take two. Way before the money personalities or love languages entered the scene, the four temperaments are probably the oldest form of categorizing innate differences that exist. First coined by Hippocrates, who labeled them after body fluids, hence the kind of strange names. Over centuries, intellects and spiritual leaders have picked it up and developed it further, so that today it's become a popular staple of our church. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is definitely not pop psychology or a new age. The church has used it over centuries as a spiritual aid 
So saints such as Ignatius and Francis de Sales frequently cited and used the temperaments. What's beautiful about this concept is that it's based on the idea that all of us are made in the image and likeness of God and reflect something of his mystery and image and likeness. It's built on the premise that there are many different ways that we can reflect his image. In other words, God can be loud and big. He created the universe, thunder and lightning. But God is also reflected in the still small voice. So things of creation that are quiet, soft, and gentle are also reflections of God. And the four temperaments truly embody this. They're very much complementary. We need all of them because, again, together, they're the fullest image of God himself. All right, so again, it's going to be just a quick overview with resources at the end if you want to get in deeper. I included though because it had great results in helping spouses understand each other as well as any kids or relatives in the picture. And for each temperament, I'll give a little description and then highlight some relational specifics such as sociability, focus, and needs. To kick things off, we'll start with our talker, the sanguine, who's usually represented by an otter. Sanguines are generally outgoing, fun, silly, lively, and very optimistic. They're usually the life of the party and childlike. They like to enjoy life to the fullest. They are all about attention and affection. They want to be loved, they want to be seen, and they want to be affirmed. Sanguines often have big feels and big smiles. Some challenges for them could include being superficial, struggling with follow-through, inordinate love of pleasure, and tending towards the external. Sanguines, we say, are attracted to whatever is the shiniest, most exciting, and most fun. So this can contribute to them getting bored or struggling to see a stick to a task or see something through. When it comes to relationships, sanguines are extremely extroverted and sociable. Their focus isn't as strong as some of the other temperaments. As we said, they're usually distracted by whatever is trending as the most exciting at that moment or time. Needs for them in a relationship include attention, fun activities together, positive interaction, flexibility, doing things together, and joy in life. Weaknesses in relationships could include being hasty or superficial, and tending to flee from the negative. Sanguines usually want to be happy and positive all the time. But as we know, we can't always avoid pain or negative things. Also bouncing a lot of balls at one time because they usually have so many interests and get so excited by possibilities. But there's sometimes a struggle to follow through. In relationships, they're going to be upset and annoyed by lack of attention, negativity or harsh comments, indifferent, lack of fun or love in life, and anything boring or unpopular. Okay, next we have our choleric, the doer, represented by the lion. Here, the natural virtue is ambition. If a sanguine's main goal is to love everyone and have fun, their main goal is to get the job done. Clerics are very task oriented. They see the big picture and can easily direct everyone else. They like to work and produce. They're fearless and bold and sometimes in your face. They're very naturally problem solvers and they like to move through life taking care of business. They're natural leaders and usually competitive. Challenges for them could include being dominating, opinionated, prideful, and impatient. The expression is that sometimes clerics are almost too large and in charge because they're so driven and care so much about the mission or task at hand. They sometimes lose sight of other important things such as people around them, others' feelings, or more relational concerns. For sociability, 
they too are extroverted, meaning they're energized by social situation. But they're usually less talkative than the sanguine. And they also like to talk with more of a purpose and an end point. They don't always enjoy talking for the sake of talking. They're highly focused, almost to a fault. Needs in a relationship for them include loyalty, opportunities to be in control, appreciation, independence, and being in charge. Weaknesses could again be thinking their view is the best, the only right one, lacking empathy, failure to seek counsel, and struggling to apologize. They're gonna be upset and annoyed by slowness, inefficiency, disloyalty, distractions, whiners, and complainers. Ain't nobody got time for that if you're a color trying to get a job done. So again, anything that's gonna deviate or keep them from the mission or task at hand. Now, different in many ways from our choleric is going to be what is our beaver, the melancholic, or the thinker. Melancholics are deep, serious, purposeful, passionate, and very loving to the death. They will give their life for you. They're the first ones to go to the cross. They're not light and fluffy. They're genius prone, inventive, creative, and dramatic. They're usually the great artists and engineers of the world. They rarely forget things. And as a result, they sometimes have trouble forgiving. They hold on to things for a long time. They're sensitive to injustice. They appreciate silence and solitude. And they have a strong interior life. They're noble, cautious, and particular. The melancholics sometimes can struggle with things such as moodiness, being easily discouraged, lack of confidence, and being critical or suspicious. This deep interior world they have can sometimes cause them to get lost in their own mind. So overthinking or overworrying, which can isolate them or sometimes make things bigger in their head than it is in reality. They sometimes have a hard time communicating with others or sharing their deep interior world that they have. For them, when it comes to sociability, they're introverted, meaning their energy is drained by social activities. This means they usually need time to be alone and recharge, and they're usually pretty comfortable being alone. Their focus is intense, but inward and focused on detail, marked by persistence. Melancholx oftentimes value the ideal, which if left unchecked, can sometimes lead to perfectionism. And perfectionism can definitely lead to hyper-focus on a lot of details. So needs for them are going to include support, help in initiating projects or social activities, to be heard and understood, order and quiet and space, time for that recharging. Weaknesses could include being slow to initiate, indecisive, critical and inflexible at times, and if pressed for an immediate response, we'll usually say no. So unlike the decisive, quick-moving cleric, they don't usually operate well under pressure. And they're going to be upset and annoyed by lack of principles, being rushed into decisions, lack of attention to detail, superficiality, and disrespect for their personal order. All right, last but not least, our peaceful phlegmatic represented by the golden retriever. Phlegmatics are stable, steady, calm, reliable, dependable, easygoing, and lots of flexibility. Similar to the sing when they're strongly motivated by people. They love to help people and they're very supportive. They calm things down naturally. They're not task oriented or fast moving, but very peaceful. Challenges for them could include being indecisive, passive, indifferent, and unexpressive of feelings. Phlegmatics, we say, are almost too content. They're so happy to just be that they struggle at times with doing or exerting in ways that rock the boat, the status quo, or require too much discomfort. And this could be in life, relationships, 
they too tend to be reserve and tend towards introversion, but they're very easygoing. And so they're usually liked by others. Their focus is on the one hand steady because it's unmoved by externals. So they keep that calm spirit even when there's chaos. But they're very easily distracted by internal feelings of tension or discomfort. Again, because they crave that peace so much. Needs for them are then gonna include harmony, especially in their relationships, structure, respect, appreciation, time for relaxation, and peace. Weaknesses could be, again, lack of initiative, being overly compliant, and sometimes not standing up for themselves, tolerant too much of the status quo. So letting something that maybe needs to change go on longer than it should. They're going to be upset and annoyed by interpersonal conflict, noise, chaos, and intense or extreme behavior. Similar to the money personalities, the idea here is that you have a primary and a secondary. But also, ideally, as we grow in virtue, it should become harder and harder to tell what someone's temperament is. As one works hard to temper their weaknesses, cultivate their strengths, and learn the skills that don't come naturally, the idea is they come more center. And in dead center is Jesus, i.e. holiness. So we say Jesus is our perfect example of exhibiting in a balanced and healthy way the gifts that all the temperaments have to offer. So as we said before, there isn't one that's the better or right one. We need all of them in order to grow and learn and come closer to that center. And when we get to the communication talk next month, I'll look at ways that different blends of temperaments might have to cooperate in order to balance and work through their differences. But first, we're gonna shift gears just a little bit because so far we've been talking about some innate qualities in a person, so their nature in other words. But something that also strongly affects a relationship is going to be one's family of origin, their development, their experiences growing up and their environment, how they were raised and their experiences around that. This can profoundly shape and affect a person. And when there are differences in any of the areas we're about to go over, it too can be like learning a new language to adjust and find a medium or balance middle ground for the new family a couple is trying to create. So a few aspects to take note of that can be particularly shaping, starting with one's parents and the parenting style they grew up with. This one usually becomes apparent when a couple begins to start their own family. So did someone have a very permissive parent? This is someone who's lacking boundaries, very hands-off, tending towards uninvolvement. Did someone have an authoritarian parent, which is a bit like my way or the highway? We also have neglecting and rejecting parents, usually found in abusive or addictive households. Or did somebody have the ideal authoritative parenting style? This is where parents understand the needs. They're warm, responsive, and encouraging. They set expectations within reason for the age of child, and then they teach their child how to meet those expectations. Very related to this is spousal roles. How are tasks or responsibilities divided between the parents? Or maybe it was there only one parent so they had to balance all of the needs. Also religion and faith. How was faith practiced in your family? Who practiced it? Was it balanced? How big of a role did it play in a family's decisions or routine? When it comes to something like work, who worked? How much did they work? Were people workaholics? What are the expectations in this area? Again, no right or wrong, but lots of different possibilities. For vacation, we talk about active versus relaxing vacations. How often did you go on them and what kind? Did you go on them at all? Were they elaborate and expensive or simple within your means? Holidays, well, holidays are important. And how are they practiced? 
which ones were celebrated and what did it look like? What were your traditions? Cultural differences is a huge area. There's no question this has a big influence on a person and their relationships. Within culture comes customs, ideals, values, community, level of involvement, communication patterns. All of these can be greatly shaped by one's culture. Difficulties, how are difficulties handled? Do people lean in or ignore and give space? Do people talk about their problems or keep it to themselves? Do people deny or avoid things? Do people mind their own business or get involved even if it doesn't concern them? Similar to this is conflict. How is conflict handled? Are people defensive or is it used as an inevitable opportunity to discuss something? Do members get angry, stay calm, or maybe avoid it again altogether? Whether in a new relationship, coaching marriage, or already married, we take some time looking at this list and just exploring the various differences each of us brings in each category can reveal areas that may be special needed attention when it comes to blending and compromise. At the very least, it can show us where we're bringing different formative experiences or preconceived understandings on what each category looks like. All right, everyone, we are winding down here, but we've saved probably the most fascinating and research area of differences for last, the differences between men and women. As we know, this can also be a very controversial topic. But once again, for today's purposes, I'm gonna stick with the research, keeping in mind our 80-20 rule, as well as the importance of avoiding labeling, judging, or stereotyping. But the first difference I want to highlight is one that's very frequently creates stress and challenges when it's not understood in a relationship. And that has to do with the difference between men and women with what matters most to them in a relationship. And the research is actually very consistent in this area. It shows that for men, the two things they rate as the most vital or important to feel is respected and competent. While women desire most in a relationship to feel loved and pursued. And this can be hard for each gender to understand fully. So women, to start, what this is saying is that your love alone might not be registering what he needs the most. Your respect could mean more to him than even your affection. The majority of men actually report that they would rather feel unloved versus feeling inadequate or disrespected. And the two are usually connected. If he feels disrespected, he often feels unloved. So suggestions for the women. Note that public respect is huge. So tearing down your man in front of others is very painful. And sometimes it's helpful to explore with your partner if there are any areas where he's feeling disrespected. It could be going on without that at all being your intention. Sometimes it can be little things such as teasing, tone of voice, or maybe even the way questioning certain decisions. And because respect is so big, studies also show that your thank you has the same effect as what an I love you does for you. Now the male need for respect and affirmation studies show seems to be as hardwired as a woman's corresponding need to feel loved and treasured. What's interesting to note right off the bat is that the majority of women report questioning on a daily basis, would he choose me all over again? Does he really love me? These are questions that come up, especially during conflict, stress, or when their man is withdrawing or upset. In a very different light, so often the men discuss how for them, after I do, it's a done deal, meaning I chose you, I married you, so of course I love you. Case closed. But for women, it's never a done deal. It's an ongoing wonderment. And as a result, they desire to continually feel chosen, treasured, and special. So men, 
What this is saying is that in order to feel loved, it's important that you make those efforts that won her the prize again and again. Think of what you did when you were dating. So often guys reply is, but that was exhausting. I got married so that I wouldn't have to do that anymore. And yes, but to use a little sports analogy, it's as if your team won the Super Bowl and your reaction was awesome. I don't need to do any of that practicing or play running anymore. And absolutely, that's a choice, but we can almost guarantee that's going to end your career. Continuing those efforts that one that are needed in order to keep your team, or in this case, your marriage, strong. So yes, pursue, pursue, pursue. And along with variance in what matters most, there's also some pretty distinct differences in how men and women's brains are wired and operate. The most apparent being differences in the ratio of gray matter to white matter in the corpus callosum. And I promise I do a terrible Bill Nye the guy, science guy impersonation. So we're going to keep this explanation very simple. Essentially gray matter is like the computing power of the brain where the actual processing and functioning is done. While white matter is like the network cables that connect the computers of our brain for speed, allow them to work together and send signals from one computer to the next. Women have more white matter in their brain superhighway and men have more gray matter. Neither is better or worse, but each leads to a different way of processing thoughts and emotions. And this can greatly approach how some genders affect, approach things and function. A humorous slogan that captures these brain differences is the expression, men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti. So let's start with the men being waffles. What we mean is that men tend to process life in boxes. Brain researchers and social scientists call this compartmentalizing. So separating life and responsibilities into different compartments. In other words, his thinking tends to be divided into sections that have room for one issue and one issue at a time. Their preference tends towards being in just one box. As a result, it can feel like when he is at work, he's at work. When he is fixing something, he's fixing something. When he's watching TV, he is simply watching TV. The idea is that development increases the ability to jump from box to box and move from compartment to compartment, but it doesn't necessarily change their preference. Along with being box-oriented, research shows that men are problem solvers by nature. So we can describe their nature as entering into a box, sizing up a problem, formulating a solution, implementing said solution, and then moving on. If there doesn't seem to be a solution for something, the instinct, or in some cases, the temptation, is to simply move on. Most men report it doesn't feel logical to spend time on a problem he reasonably doesn't believe he can solve. Men also report that they prefer to spend most of their time in an area they can succeed in. This is such a strong motivation, men will seek out the boxes that work and ignore the boxes that confuse or make them feel like a failure. This matches up with that need we spoke of earlier to feel competent and respected. So summary, most men report feeling best about themselves when they're solving problems, and taking care of business. Hence their reported desire to spend most of their time doing what they're best at while avoiding areas in which they feel deficient. All right, so that's the men. What about the women and all that connecting white matter? Well, women, we say process information, again, the majority of the time, more like a plate of pasta. If you look at a serving of spaghetti, you'll notice there are a lot of individual noodles that all touch each other. And if you attempt to follow one noodle around the plate, you'll intersect a whole lot of other noodles. And you might even switch to another noodle seamlessly. This is how women's brains are wired to process things. Everything is connected to everything. 
every thought and issue is connected to every other thought and issue in some way. This is why women are typically very good at multitasking because her thoughts, emotions, and convictions are connected. She can process more information and keep track of more activities. As a result, most women pursue connecting life together versus solving problems as we saw with an average man. And it's not that they don't solve problems, they just report from a different perspective. For some women to quickly solve a problem when the issues in the discussion are disconnected from each other, feels almost like an act of denial or missing something. And so women report consistently sensing the need to talk things through and connect all aspects. And in conversation, she can link together the logical, emotional, relational, and spiritual aspects of what's going on. This can be challenging for many men because as she is working through all of her connection, he sometimes reports feeling as if he is jumping from box to box. These differences are a perfect lead-in for what's coming next month in our talk on communication. But we'll start looking at how these differences can affect communication. And we'll go into tips for each approach and explore how to work together to identify problem spots and difficult patterns. So that's my little promo commercial for next time. And I do, as promised, want to take a little time for any questions that have come up during the talk. But first, real quick, I want to share, as promised, some further resources if there's any area you feel called to explore further. So through the talk, there have been certain theories or books we've been referencing. So I'm going to pass along these titles as good ones to use for follow-up. The first one is The Temperament That God Gave Your Spouse, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman, The Five Money Personalities, and also Men Are Like Waffles and Women Are Like Spaghetti. As mentioned, you can also take some assessments online for identifying your couple profile. For the money personalities, you can go to themoneycouple.com and there's a free inventory and more information. For love languages, they have something similar at fivelovelanguages.com. I also have a temperament assessment that we'll be sending out at the same time that we send this recorded video. I like to send it afterwards as opposed to before because I really like to be able to stress that 80-20 rule and not putting people in boxes first. Um, but please feel free to take the assessment. Sometimes it can be a great conversation starter. All right, so I know we're getting late, so I am going to take a quick peek, see if any questions, please feel free to jump off if you have kids, bedtimes, or other things that are going on. I just want to say real quick, it's definitely been an honor to have everybody here this evening. And let me try to find our chat feature. 